Countries across the globe are adding wind turbines and solar panels to their grids by the thousands. And Australia is one of the leaders, with wind and solar energy growing from 1.5% of our grid in 2010 to over 30% today. But will the government's dreams of 90% renewables come true? Or is the renewable energy honeymoon over? Keep watching as we unpack the CIS Energy Team's latest paper, which explains why starting the energy transition is easy and the rest is hard. First up, we analyzed power prices and wind and solar shares across the world, and here are the results. The more wind and solar power a country has in its grid, the higher its electricity prices. See that empty space? If relying on wind and solar to provide more than 40% of your grid's electricity was cheap, there would be countries there. But there aren't, because they don't exist. High wind and solar shares always come with higher prices. And this trend only becomes stronger when we look at the top 30 richest countries. Once again, the more wind and solar, the higher the prices. Taking a closer look at some of these countries should raise alarm bells for anyone thinking the energy transition will be easy. Germany's 40% wind and solar grid has pushed prices higher than anywhere in the world, with major industrial players declaring the country is now in the worst economic crisis since World War II. Only 12 days after Spain briefly hit 100% renewables, it faced a country-wide blackout due to a fault in a solar inverter and a subsequent voltage oscillation. This resulted in the deaths of eight people. A tragedy that would not have occurred if the country had not eroded its grid stability by relying too heavily on intermittent renewables. Then we have Denmark, the country with the highest wind and solar penetration in the world and the highest electricity prices in 2023. Since then, its renewables build out has slowed considerably, with the government having to cancel a three gigawatt offshore wind auction after no bids were received. And now for an example of a country that isn't pursuing a renewables dominated grid, China. But hang on, isn't China leading the world in building wind and solar farms? Technically, yes, but they're also leading the world in building coal plants. In fact, over the past couple of years, China has been responsible for more than 90% of coal plant construction across the globe. By building more of everything, China has kept their wind and solar penetration below 20%, which has also kept their power prices relatively low. And their government knows this. It's why this year they introduced a new policy that shifts wind and solar farms away from guaranteed fixed prices and onto a more market-based mechanism. This will help ensure wind and solar capacity remains a relatively low proportion of their grid. So what is it about wind and solar energy that leads to higher prices? It all comes down to weather dependency. Modern economies need electricity on demand, but solar panels and wind turbines only provide electricity when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. This means that as you add more wind and solar to the grid, you eventually reach the local saturation point. This is where electricity supply from wind and solar starts exceeding electricity demand in a given area. Saturation means that sometimes there is too much solar and wind for the grid to handle, while at other times there still isn't enough solar and wind to meet demand. This mismatch has three solutions, all of which increase costs. Number one, energy is wasted. This is often called curtailment or spillage, where the energy that is surplus to demand is simply wasted. The more energy you waste, the less use you get out of your solar panels and wind turbines, and overbuilding means increased costs. Number two, energy is moved through time. Storage can be added to the system to capture the surplus energy as it is generated and time shifted to be consumed later when it is needed. But batteries and pumped hydro ain't free, so this will increase costs. Number three, energy is moved through space. Transmission lines can transport surplus energy to a place that needs it at the time it is generated. But since our grid was not designed to move such vast quantities of electricity between far-flung places, more transmission lines have to be built and this increases costs. So regardless of whether you waste, store and or move excess energy, once you reach local saturation, costs will only go up. And the more wind and solar you build beyond this point, the faster costs will increase because each additional unit of energy has to be moved further and further in space and time. This is where the idea of the renewable energy honeymoon comes in. 
Adding wind turbines and solar panels to the grid is easy at the start because you can build on the windiest and sunniest sites that are close to existing transmission lines. Thermal generators like coal and gas plants that provide stability for the grid can simply be turned down a bit to make room for renewables. But this honeymoon period doesn't last forever. Mathematically speaking, the local saturation point must occur at or before wind and solar reaches 60% of grid penetration. In the Australian context, when we factor in the weak anti-correlation of renewables and the current ratio of wind and solar in our grid, this number drops to 32%. But realistically, it's more like 20% due to the minimum level at which our existing coal and gas generators must keep running. All this means is that the honeymoon period for Australia ended at 20%, and we're now at over 30% wind and solar. With the honeymoon now well and truly over, prices will only keep going up because more and more energy must be wasted or moved through space or time. And if you don't believe the maths, then let me take you through some of the key real-world signs that the honeymoon is over. First up, we have the energy market operator asking for a backstop mechanism so it can remotely switch off rooftop solar systems. This is a clear sign that the local saturation point has been reached and energy must now be wasted, reducing the profits of rooftop solar investors. The only way to avoid this energy being wasted is through costly upgrades to the distribution network or the government providing billions in taxpayer subsidies to encourage people to buy otherwise uneconomic home batteries which is exactly what they're doing. Then there's the tens of billions of dollars in transmission lines we're supposed to be rolling out in the next decade. And yes, building everything everywhere all at once is a terrible idea, which is causing transmission cost blowouts of 100% or more. And that's before we even get started on system stability. When the Araring coal plant closes in 2027, the risk of blackouts will spike in New South Wales. No one really knows exactly how much it will cost to ensure grid stability in a wind and solar powered grid. But we do know that transmission company Transgrid will have to buy 21 synchronous condensers, large spinning machines that provide grid inertia, at a cost of $2.2 billion. And this is just the beginning. It's no wonder why governments keep extending coal plants past their planned retirement dates, because coal keeps the grid stable for free as a byproduct of its generation. And finally, the clearest sign that the honeymoon is over, the Capacity Investment Scheme. With practically zero new wind and solar farms being committed to by investors of their own accord, the federal government is forking out untold billions in taxpayer underwriting to ensure these uneconomic projects still get built. You can see from this graph how practically all of the generation projects in the last decade have had significant government support compared to the last couple of decades where most of them had only minimal or some support. Pretty much the only reason there are any investors still interested in building renewables is because of government handouts. That means it won't just be current consumers paying the price for the renewables build out. Future generations will also have to shoulder the enormous burden of debt our government is leaving them. It's about time that our policymakers took off their rose-colored glasses and accepted reality. The renewable energy honeymoon is over, and the energy transition will only get slower and harder from here on out. The question now is not the pace of the transition, but whether building a renewables-dominated grid is economically feasible in the first place. Until policymakers accept reality, Australia cannot have a productive debate about what our future energy system should look like.